afternoon. My name is Danny Seabright. I'm president of the US UAE Business Council. And we could not be more delighted uh, this morning and this afternoon in the, to fr for friends in the UAE and the Middle East to welcome you to our webinar on the UAE's defense sector. We are pleased to have over 300 guests registered to attend today's session, uh, comprising business executives, government officials, and thought leaders from the United States, the UAE, Israel, and the wider Middle East region. I would like to uh, say thank you to all who are joining. Uh, we, we are joined by four business executives who understand the UAE's defense sector better than almost anyone. Uh, Bernie Dunn, Vice President at Boeing International and President of Boeing Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey. Tamer Ali, Regional Director of Business Development for General Atomics. Paul Casey, Director of Business Development at Northrop Grumman. And Mr. Alan Davis, Chief Executive at Raytheon Emirates. We appreciate them taking the time to share their insights on the keys to success in the UAE defense market, UAE procurement priorities, and avenues for partnership for American companies going forward. After each of our panelists makes brief opening remarks, the panelists will engage in a discussion and question and answer session moderated by Kirsten Fontenrose. We could not be more delighted to have Kirsten with us today to moderate this panel. Uh, she is an expert on defense and security issues. She's currently the director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council where she leads the security pillar within its Middle East programs. Kirsten is also a former US government official who has extensive experience working with the Gulf countries. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kristen, or excuse me, to Kirsten, but first I'll say a few administrative items. The panelists will take some questions from the audience, which Kirsten will moderate. So please submit those questions using the Q&A function. This event is on the record, but close to press and a video of the event will be posted on our website and sent to all attendees soon after the event concludes. Kirsten, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Danny. I'm looking forward to this discussion, so let's dive right in with thoughts from the panelists to kick us off. Our first speaker is Bernie Dunn, Vice President of Boeing International and President of Boeing Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey. Bernie is fluent in Arabic, has more than 30 years of experience with the Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey, nearly all of it involving living and working in the region. He was noted to be a career officer in the US Army. We thank you for your service, Bernie. The UAE has turned to Boeing for a wide array of defense equipment, including AH-64D Apache Longbow attack helicopters, CH-47F Chinook helicopters, and C-17 Globemaster III airlifters. Bernie, please do us the honor of kicking us off. Thank you so much, Kirsten. It's really a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the US UAE Business Council, as always, for pulling together another, uh, another panel discussion and seminar. These are great. I have my team following these all the time. Um, we have a very, we at Boeing here have a very uh, both unique and enduring relationship with the UAE. Uh, unique in the sense that uh, of all the panelists uh, on, our, on our talk today, uh, I represent a company that has not only a, a large installed base of defense equipment here, but also an extremely large uh, uh, presence in, in the commercial sector. And in fact, uh, in normal years, the commercial piece of the Boeing company uh, actually is larger than our defense business. Um, and so, uh, you know, a very unique uh, company uh, to talk about the defense business. On the other hand, uh, it's an enduring relationship because we have been working in this country nonstop for about 42 years. Uh, our history in the UAE goes back to 1978 when we delivered a VIP aircraft to the Amiri flight in Dubai. And since then, it's only grown both on the defense and the commercial sector. Um, uh, another example of the importance of this uh, country to the Boeing company is that our regional base for the entire region that you mentioned is right here in the UAE, specifically in Dubai. Uh, we have the largest footprint of our employee base around the region right here in the UAE, uh, both working defense issues and commercial issues. Uh, we are deeply embedded in partnerships throughout the UAE. Uh, in Abu Dhabi, we've got partnerships with Mubadala that, uh, that saw the creation of Strata. Uh, with Boeing's help, which is the first uh, 
uh, composite uh, uh, producer of aircraft parts and aviation aerospace parts in the entire region. Also, our, our partnership with Tawazin, which has led to Edge Precision Industries, uh, where we have created uh, uh, precision uh, instrumentation and, uh, and metallic coating and a new facility down in Abu Dhabi to do all of that. So these are very unique uh, uh, capabilities that uh, we helped create along with our partners in Abu Dhabi in this country. We've also got deep partnerships with NGOs, universities and whatnot. And um, we're very committed to this market. It's very important to us. And we're not here just to sell products and services. We're here to uh, do all of this in conjunction, hand in hand with our partners in, in, in the country. And it's just a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to work in the UAE. Thank you so much, Bernie. Our next speaker is Tamar Ali, Regional Director of Business Development for the Middle East at General Atomics Aeronautical Systems. Tamar has extensive experience in the defense industry, including with Lockheed Martin, Amrock, and Rockwell Collins. As many of you know, the UAE agreed in 2013 to purchase unarmed Predator XP UAVs from General Atomics. In doing so, the UAE became the first non-NATO customer for this drone. Tamar, I pass the virtual microphone to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Kirsten, for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, thank you, of course, to the US UAE Business Council for um, organizing uh, this event. Um, as, you, as you introduced um, General Atomics, uh, comparatively, of course, to Boeing, and uh, uh, um, as Bernie talked about uh, their uh, long 40-year history, um, we are the new kids on the block, um, having only been here for a little bit under a decade. Um, however, we have made uh, what we like to think quite an impression um, with the country and um, with its overall planning. Um, both General Atomics and the UAE share uh, a common philosophy and that is uh, to invest in uh, the next generation technologies and to um, utilize game-changing uh, uh, methods uh, of employment, especially in uh, supporting the warfighter. Uh, and General Atomics likes to think, of course, that it played a key role um, in the UAE's planning in now and long into the future. Um, Bernie touched on a great point, which is um, uh, the core of the topic that we're discussing today, which is uh, doing business in the UAE defense industry um, is uh, a change, it requires a change in mentality away from the transactional and uh, a focus on uh, a long lasting partnership, uh, truly, truly investing in the country and its vision. Um, and there probably is no country, definitely in the Middle East, but globally that focuses on the future, not only of its people, um, but its place globally uh, more than the UAE. And uh, General Atomics is, is honored and proud to be a partner um, and uh, we look forward to growing um, that relationship uh, uh, over time. Thank you, Tamar. Now we welcome Paul Casey, who is Director of Business Development at Northrop Grumman. Paul is also a seasoned defense industry executive with extensive experience at Lockheed Martin as well as Northrop Grumman. Paul also spent 24 years in the Royal Air Force in the UK. Thank you for your service to the UK, Paul, where he was responsible for air battle management and defense acquisition. Northrop has been a close and trusted partner of the UAE for decades across a wide variety of systems I'm sure Paul will mention to us. So Paul, please take it away. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, and thank you, Danny, for having the opportunity to, uh, to speak on such an August panel on such an interesting topic at such an interesting time. Uh, as you say, I've got about 40 years uh, defense uh, experience, half and half uh, in uniform uh, and the rest in defense industry. Uh, and I've spent the last 10 years here in the United Arab Emirates, uh, five with, uh, with our friends from Lockheed Martin and five here uh, with Northrop Grumman. What a great place to live. Uh, I, I think for a defense executive, you couldn't live in a better country. Uh, the United Arab Emirates has ambition, it is never short of vision, and it has determination. Uh, and what I really like about working here, rather than working in the United Kingdom, or in Europe, or elsewhere in the world, 
is that once they have a plan and a strategy, they actually implement that, even if it takes 10 to 15 to 20 years. So it's a, a great privilege to work here. Uh, it's, a, it's a small country. I think the, the United Arab Emirates may consider themselves outnumbered on the battlefield, but never outclassed because it's a technological edge uh, that they acquire and they train for and they bring to the party. And I think they've been a very proud supporter of US uh, operations in the region for the last 25 years. And they're great leaders in the region in their own right. Uh, it is a, a great market. Uh, I graduated from the Royal Air Force uh, College in 1980. And that was the first year we put one of our long range surveillance radars into Abu Dhabi. So Bernie beat us by a couple of years, but we've been here for 40 and we're looking forward to being here for the next 40. Thank you, Paul. Our final speaker is Alan Davis. Alan is the chair, chief executive for Raytheon Emirates, which is importantly a landed company of Raytheon Technologies based in Abu Dhabi. Alan has 30 plus years of industry experience with over 25 in program management. Raytheon Emirates extensive work in the UAE includes that on the Patriot Missile Defense System, a name, com, uh, a household name to all of us. So Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, um, Danny and the UAE. EUS Business Council. Um, so we, we have had a 32 plus year presence here in the UAE and all, all the panelists will tell you that it's a relationship and it's a partnership. And the byproduct of that relationship and partnership here in the UAE has enabled us to continue to operate here as a business providing leading edge technology systems and solutions that give them regional security provides for their sovereignty and allows them to operate freely, whether they're at sea with the UAE Navy, their Air Force Air Defense, Joint Aviation Command. And so we have um, really enjoyed that relationship. It's you know, a testament to the relationship based on program performance, delivery quality, and keeping pace with the regional threats here in their environment. Um, as we've evolved to a landed company, that gives us a unique opportunity here to be a part of an ecosystem, a part of the economy, to help them with their industrial goals of being able to have Emirati knowledge-based leaders, have technology, and provide for their own systems and solutions to provide for their own capabilities. And so we're excited to be here. I would tell you, I have come here probably the last 15 years. Every year it's an exciting dynamic year. This year is no different. And when you see all the things that are happening here from an environment, from a business and from a geopolitical scenario, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be here and be a part of the UAE economy and continue to evolve the partnership and the relationship and working with them and providing that security. Ellen, thank you. He's framing remarks in mind. I'll begin by posing a few questions now to Bernie, Tamara, Paul, and recognizing the rare opportunity we have here to elicit insights from four titans of industry at once. So let's begin with the foundational driver of defense decision-making between the US and the UAE, which is the nature of regional threats. Bernie and Paul, if I may pose this to you two first, inviting Tamara and Alan to add thoughts following if they'd like. It is tough to nail down the top threat to Emirati security today. We're in the middle of a global pandemic that makes military exercises and deployments difficult, the UAE is watching an expeditionary Iran across the water, and the US is looking at ways to rebalance its interests in the Middle East with its interests in places like Eastern Europe and the South China Sea. So what do you see as the greatest security threats facing the region in the next five years, and how will those drive requirements? Bernie, can you please begin the conversation on that rather hefty topic? Sure, Kirsten. I mean, there there are a wide variety of a uh, wide array of threats. There's no doubt, and um, some are low tech, some are high tech, some are in the middle. Uh, one of the things that I would single out uh, right now is exactly what we saw in Saudi Arabia last year, which was a a very well executed strike by uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and uh, these are relatively inexpensive to produce and operate. Uh, they uh, they can attack a target that that has that is um, protected by a very high tech system, for example, against ballistic missiles, 
uh, and evade that, uh, that belt of protection and get right in and hit the target. We saw that you know, live last year with Saudi Arabia and the oil facilities. I think this is one of the threats that, uh, that all uh, governments, frankly, in the world, but certainly in this region are facing right now. And, uh, and it's a real issue. And, uh, you know, it requires persistent surveillance over certain targets that, uh, or certain nodes that could become targets, such as airports, such as um, uh, oil facilities, port facilities, uh, oil pipelines, um, Im important uh, buildings. You know, there's an endless number of potential targets. And, you know, part of the equation is persistent surveillance over your own facilities that could become targets. And secondly, methods of detecting incoming un, uh, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles, sometimes at low levels, always at night. And uh, how do you take out that low, low, low tech threat? So uh, I think all of our companies are working on these sorts of things. I know my company certainly is, both with uh, using lasers for hard kills and other drones for soft kills. But um, it's, a, it's a challenge, and uh, we're only in the infancy, really, of how to counter all of this. And people are actually beginning to think about it. For years and years, there wasn't even much thought going into it. But I would put that on the table as one of the threats that, uh, that everybody, including the UAE, is facing right now. Thank you so much, Bernie. And Paul, can we hear your thoughts on the same question? What do you see as the greatest security threats facing the region in the next five years, and how they might drive requirements? I would certainly uh, echo the sentiments of Bernie, uh, critical national infrastructure protection uh, and counter UAS is absolutely uh, at the top of the, uh, the priority lists. Uh, I, I would say that uh, our friends uh, to the east, uh, Iran and the proxies throughout the region are destabilizing the region uh, and that is certainly in the next five years likely to continue. Uh, we, we've also seen a, a resurgence uh, President Erdogan in Turkey, uh, I don't know if he's looking to replicate the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, but he's destabilizing elements in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the European Union. Uh, we're seeing actions in Syria. Uh, we're seeing actions in Libya, which aren't good for a regional perspective. Uh, and then again, we have non-state actors. Uh, you know, the, there are non-kinetic threats, uh, cyber security threats that can be, uh, can be launched with devastating effect by non-state actors. And I think in the next five years, those are the types of things that the United Arab Emirates government, and in fact, all of the governments in this region need to be concerned about as their key threats. Emmer and Alan, if you'd like to add to what Bernie and Paul have described, we welcome your comments. Yeah, I think, I think Bernie hit it right on the spot. Certainly the events and Saudi raised an eye and a concern that we had not seen um, here in the region and how we counter that UAS is very different because it's not only a military threat, but it's a civil threat. And so depending on how we address that threat in terms of to track the target um, and terminate that threat is very different in an urban environment versus a non-urban environment. And there's not gonna be a one system solution fits all. It's gonna be you know an integrated, um, systems approach of how you layer that defense and whether which type of effect you use. Do we use a laser? Do we use some type of jamming? Or do we let this thing just kind of drift out into space? We don't want to be taking very high-end systems to take out these low-cost threats. And so it's a problem here. It's something that is you know a very high priority within all of our companies that we continue to work with here in the UAE because it is a low cost threat and that's easily to proliferated within the region that needs to be addressed. Hammer. And, uh, yeah, if I can uh, add to it, um, I think uh, my uh, fellow panelists, I think described the threats quite accurately um, in, in Bernie really did hit the nail on the head um, with the increased needs for persistent situational awareness. Um, I think, um, over the course of the last decades, specifically, there's been a great amount of lessons learned on the part of the UAE. And, and one thing that um, anybody who's done business uh, in the defense space with the UAE comes to find um, quite uh, quickly is that 
Um, this is a quickly evolving uh, country when it comes to uh, uh, sensing the needs and addressing them. Um, situational awareness was overlooked uh, for quite some time, uh, not only here in the Middle East, but globally. Um, and we see it, of course, first and foremost at General Atomics um, as the maker of the world's, you know, uh, most uh, ubiquitous uh, medium altitude long endur endurance uh, UAS. Uh, it is situational awareness that carries the day. And um, this country uh, is uh, truly at the forefront when it comes to employment and um, it uh, is making the right investments uh, to, uh, to, to be at the forefront uh, of persistent situational awareness in the future. One related point, um, in, apart from the threats that uh, the fellow panelists identified quite well, it's happening at the same time as there's a shift at play. Um, a, a, one of the hallmarks of our current administration and, and it's something that we all applaud is uh, the willingness of uh, the White House to uh, depend on its key allies to do the heavy lifting um, when it comes to uh, uh, the defense space. And uh, there is no better ally than the UAE um, and a dependence on the UAE to do more um, is, is something that the U.S. Is, has been supporting and continues to support. And uh, uh, it, it really does help when it comes to um, our discussions with the UAE um, that there is that movement um, to allow them to do more of their own uh, uh, defense work in the region. Thank you so much. And let's expand on this topic of the outlook for the future. And Tamara, if I can just begin with you this time, other than threats, are there other shifts in technology, geopolitics, global business, demographics, climate, whatever it might be, any other realm that you see transforming the Emirati relationship with US defense companies in the coming five to 10 years? Uh, absolutely, I think the, the most obvious is uh, a move towards a dependence on um, systems, uh, specifically integrated systems and uh, technology such as AI. Um, the UAE uh, continually punches above its weight class, um, be it diplomatically, uh, be it as a warfighter. And um, we tend to forget that it is not, um, you know, a 350 million uh, uh, population country like the United States. Um, they do a lot with what they have, and a lot of that is investing in uh, technologies that act as force multipliers um, and allow them to do more with less. Um, and that is where I see a, a, a great shift uh, in a focus of those integrated systems um, and automation to allow them to do uh, more missions, more effectively, more efficiently uh, with less Thank you, thank you. Alan, anything to add to this? Yeah, I think I would kind of follow up on Tamar's comment. You know, here in the UAE, their threat is very persistent. And traditionally, they have relied on all of our things to provide them that security and other countries as well. And so one of the things that they want to ensure of, and one of the things that we're seeing here is the energy and the priority around developing their own um, industrial base around defense because you can see a position and a concern where they don't want to be reliant on other people's systems and then be tied up because of a political change or a congressional change and so they're going to continue to support and buy those systems through our various companies and through the state department but on the same token, they're gonna hedge their bet to make sure in the event things get delayed or they're not able to procure what they need, that they sustain and have that capability here to support those systems, but also to develop and deliver their own systems to provide that type of security. Bernie, um, Paul, any comments to add to that? Yes, Kirsten, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go from the geopolitical angle here. I think there are a couple of things that, um, that uh, bring great concern, not only to the UAE, but to the whole region. Uh, the first of those is oil and what's happening with oil prices. And um, 
you all have probably seen the uh, the IMF report that uh, was released, I believe, just yesterday concerning uh, the forecast for oil prices next year and uh, kind of where the, the Gulf uh, oil producing economies are right now and their projections into the next year. So, um, you know, uh, there's a real challenge there for, for lots of countries in this region and frankly, for all the oil producers of the world. That's going to have an impact on thinking and it's going to have an impact on budgets. Uh, the second thing that I would say would be China. Uh, China has um, uh, very successfully extended its influence uh, over the last 10, 15 years, well into this uh, uh, region as well as into Africa. And by the way, I want to commend uh, Danny and the U.S. UAE Business Council on the uh, the seminar last last week or the week before on China, which I thought was excellent. And you know, uh, I think they they hit it on the head when they described the relationship between the UAE and China as tactical, whereas the relationship between the UAE and the United States is strategic. And um, I would certainly rather be in the strategic category, uh, kind of a transactional tactical relationship with China, but it is there, it is a concern for a lot of people. The third thing, uh, and something that I think they're doing a really good job with is food security. Uh, all the countries in this region, uh, have an issue with food security. And I think the UAE is really addressing it very well. They've named a, uh, a minister for food security, as you know, we all know her quite well. Um, uh, you take a look at uh, the, the pandemic and the, the, you know, the closure of the world economy effectively over the last seven or eight months. Uh, I've been here the whole time and I don't think we lacked for anything in this country. You go to a store and it, it was, uh, a food store on a normal day back in the United States or anywhere else. We, we had everything we needed and, and hats off to uh, Minister Miriam and her team and everybody who worked on this and to the leadership of the country. They are addressing the food security issue and I think doing a great job with it. And it's something that uh, all the countries in this region, I think will continue to focus on because uh, if nothing else, this COVID pandemic really bought, brought home the need to have that. Paul, any comments to add? Well, I think a lot has been said. Uh, certainly China is of great interest in the next five to 10, perhaps 20 years. Uh, I think I live in the Emirate of Dubai, uh, that China has just opened its first school in, in the, uh, the Emirate here, and there are 200,000 Chinese nationals that live in Dubai. So uh, quite, a, quite a change in the 10 years that I've been here in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I think I will touch one area, and that's the US-UAE strategic dialogue uh, that's going ahead and continues to go ahead. Uh, you know, we've got eight domains there. Uh, thankfully, two of them are defense uh, and space. Uh, and I think five to 10 years time, there's a great opportunity for Team USA uh, to really become the partner of preference for the United Arab Emirates in its space endeavors. Uh, and as I said, the UAE never lacks for ambition or vision, and they have a great vision uh, and a great organization to support that vision in space. And I think that is gonna be a real area that collectively the US government working with US industry in partnership with UAE entities can make a great difference. Thank you so much. I'd, I'd like to dive a bit now into the comments that were made about China since those were prevalent in all of your comments um, as, as questions are coming in from our audience as well. Are you concerned about competition from Chinese companies with the growing relationship, uh, you know, tactical as it is between the UAE and China? And then secondary to that, there's concern, as you know, in the U.S. about that, about that growing relationship because of fears about espionage. Do you all worry at all about um, the vulnerability of your technologies in the UAE with, as a result of a growing relationship between the UAE and China? So, you know, first to, to competition and second to espionage threat. Paul, would you like to start? Certainly, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think there's no reason for any US com uh, company to fear fair competition from China. We have the best technology, we have the best support, uh, and we are decades ahead of China. Espionage is, is certainly a, a, a fear. Uh, I remember uh, standing with uh, Admiral Willie Moore, uh, Chief Executive to Lockheed Martin, at the Farnborough Air Show, 
and the chief of air staff of the uh, Chinese Air Force came up and was admiring a like one-for-one -one model of the F-35. And uh, Admiral Moore, being the, uh, the ultimate salesman he was, he said, uh, are you interested in buying this aircraft, sir? And the chap said, yes. And he said, how many would you like? He said, we'll only need one. Uh, and that's something that we've got to look at very carefully because they are very good at stealing IP. They are very good exploiting other people's IP to try and get to catch up technologically where American companies are. Thank you so much. Thoughts from others on, on uh, Chinese competition or espionage? Yeah, I, I think from the, from the competition side, Kristen, I think we're all comfortable about the quality, the level of technology that we have with our US products and services. And I think the more concern we have is as the relationship between China and the UAE grows and continues, there is a concern that certainly the Defense Technology Security Agency shares with us and that's how do we safeguard the technology that we have here in the region so it doesn't get exploited, so it doesn't get compromised. You know, I'm, I'm very proud that here recently we hosted a, you know, a survey by DITSA and we did very well. And that contingent diligence around safeguarding technology here is going to allow for additional technologies to come into the region. But it is a concern, not from a competition perspective, but from a compromise of technology because they will take and exploit shamelessly and we need to make sure we have everything that we can do to protect that technology in place here. Not only for the, for the US technology, but certainly even for the UAE's technology and their own regional security. Bernie, your timer. I don't think I have anything to add, uh, Kirsten. These guys have said it all. Um. I would like to make uh, just one more point uh, and maybe put a finer point on it. Um, in, the, in the UAS space, um, the, the Chinese uh, uh, you know, proliferation of their product um, in the Middle East is, is pretty well known. Um, and one thing that uh, we at General Atomics take very seriously and we're, we're you know, overjoyed, to, of course, to see that the UAE um, likewise takes it seriously is that um, it's not about um, the product that we export, which in the case of the US in the UAS space is far and away uh, much more advanced than um, any global, global maker of, of systems. Um, it is the fact that when we export those products um, as a US defense contractor, we also export the, uh, the responsible employment of those products, the methods. And, um, the opportunity, the opportunity to do that um, and to work closely with a partner like the UAE and share those methods. And um, it's not forgotten, and I know it's appreciated by our, our counterparts here in country, that those methods of employment were born over um, decades of use and um, at great cost. And when we are exporting that US technology, um, and we export that, that responsible employment, um, we just create a stronger ally. Um, and so the, the, the Chinese issue, of course, is near and dear to our heart because um, they clearly do not have that same mentality. Um, so you know, we're happy to see that the, the UAE takes those issues seriously and with the advances they've made um, in their, in their uh, DITSA-like organizations, um, we see that just becoming stronger and more uh, of an issue that's at the forefront of our of our dealings and, and less an afterthought. You great points. I'd like to go back to a comment that Alan made and ask two questions. Alan, you you spoke a bit about the UAE developing its own industrial base around defense. And if I could ask a, if I could ask two questions here, and uh, and Alan, I'll start with you. The first question that comes in from one of our viewers is. Your company is working on products that are indigenous to the UAE, you know, specifically for the Middle East and the unique requirements in the region. And then, Alan, you know, Raytheon, as well as other companies, has been working to develop a local workforce and to employ Emirati nationals in technical or executive roles. What have you all learned during the implementation of this vision? What could the UAE do to make it easier for you to hire more Emirati citizens as you work to, to build out their own industrial base here? Yeah, so. Thank you. So let me, let me try the, the, the first question. You know, we, we've had this relationship here in the UAE and a partnership with the UAE for, for many years. 
and we've worked with them locally to develop industrial capability, but more importantly, indigenous systems. And, and we have those products here and we continue to develop those so that they have the ability to provide for their own armed services, but also the ability to export those to other markets for other missions and for other capabilities. And we'll continue to do that. And that's one of the founding elements that brought us here to the UAE with our landed company. Um, we established this company three years ago. First year, I will tell you, was the establishment of the branches, the business plans, those types of things. In the last two years, we've started to develop not only the, the, the industrial base here and the supply base, but working with the stakeholders here on the missions and markets that they want to pursue. And as a part of that, we've had the really the, the, the privilege to be integrated with the higher colleges here of education, whether it's New York University, Khalifa University, Abu Dhabi, higher colleges of technology. We, we have a very vibrant and a very um, large intern program here that we utilize the, the, you know, the Emiratis here to um, get them introduced to our business and our processes and technologies, but also learn about how we do business here in the UAE. And I, I will tell you, there is not a shortage of talent here in the UAE. The, the level of education, the level of energy that these students have coming out of the universities is phenomenal. Um, we've been fortunate to hire many of them and we will continue to do that. In fact, this Thursday is kind of the exit program for our last group of interns. And so that's not gonna be a limiter here for us as we grow a business. And the one thing the UAE absolutely is um, committed to is diversity and inclusiveness. And their desire is not to have 100% Emirati business. They like the inclusiveness, the diversity of thought, the creativity, and the fuel for generating innovation by having people from the US, people from the UAE, people from other nations here as a part of it. And so it, it's, a, it's a very encouraging position for us to be in. We're excited about it. We're trying to accelerate as best we can given the current pandemic, new products, new technologies here in the UAE to support their goals for their indigenous capability. Great. Bernie, anything to add to that? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, picking up where Alan left off there, there, I would say that our efforts here are two or possibly threefold in what we're doing. Number one, you know, the, uh, the strength of any economy is actually in the private sector. And um, in this region, the private sectors have tended to be lacking. Uh, people prefer employment with the, with the government, ministries and whatnot, uh, by and large. We've worked really hard to assist the government in its vision of diversifying the economy, creating a strong private sector. We do quite a bit of work with uh, NGOs involved in STEM training, in entrepreneurship, education for employment. Uh, we also uh, have uh, various university programs with three universities here in the UAE. Uh, and more importantly, kind of the second phase of this is what we're doing at the university level and, uh, and higher than that with, uh, with people who are actually employed. So you take our, uh, our, our partnership out at Strata in Al Ain uh, that I mentioned earlier. Strata is the first and as far as I know, only uh, manufacturer, indigenous manufacturer of complex aerospace structures. They build uh, parts for our Boeing airplanes. The crown jewel of this program is, uh, is the 787 vertical fin, our Dreamliner vertical fin. They have a contract with us to produce the vertical fin for the 787. And they're doing quite a good job with it, um, uh, both technically and, uh, and price-wise. We're very pleased with them. We've sent a number of their employees, uh, including some, uh, some ladies, to our various plants in the United States and elsewhere to do side-by-side -side training with our technicians on, on, on the work that they have to do within that plant. And they've come back and really contributed to the effort. Um, we also have an IBIP program, an international business internship program where we take selected uh, Emirati kids, uh, either still in university or just, just graduated, send them to work for six months with our business units in the United States on various sorts of functions and uh, when they've come back, we've actually hired uh, a number of those into the Boeing company. 
And so it's this sort of stuff. And if there was one thing that I would say is um, uh, as this partnership that unfolds that we have with the government on, on stressing the private sector, um, I'd like to see more emphasis uh, here in the UAE on joining the public, the, the private sector. There's a great emphasis on joining the public sector, but we'd like uh, to see folks uh, be encouraged to take some risk and you know, jump into the private sector with both feet and, and try it out. It's sort of a new thing in this part of the world and, and in the UAE, but we think that's the key to success going forward. Tamar and Paul, would you like to add to that? Any comments there on building an indigenous workforce, helping build an industrial uh, base that's indigenous to the UAE or specific products for the Middle East that you all are working on? Well, I, I would just say Alan and, and Bernie, I think have really, again, hit the, the nail on the head. It's the interns that are really valuable. Uh, you know, the United Arab Emirates has a tremendous education program at secondary and tertiary education, but it's a practical experience that you need to translate that great education into great business acumen and successful and sustainable business. You know, I look back to, over our history, uh, 25 years ago, uh, one of our heritage companies helped set up uh, Abu Dhabi shipbuilding. Uh, and that was a great success for us. It was the Newport News uh, shipbuilding company that later became the Norfolk Grumman shipbuilding company. Uh, and that gave us a great insight into the capabilities of the local workforce. And it became so successful that within five years of operation, the local government had bought it out. So it became a truly indigenous capability that does have great capabilities now. And it's that type of success story where you've got partnership to start with between these great US companies and local uh, entities. And within a few years, not only can they stand on their feet, but they can run, they can jog, and they can sprint as fast as anyone else. Thank you, Tamar. Comments there? Yeah, I won't. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the panelists, I think, covered this quite well. Um, but there's a, a point I wanted to add on to something that uh, Alan had said. And it's hard to put, um, to describe this uh, in words. You have to sort of see it and experience it to truly understand it. Um, the level of excitement uh, on the part of the Emiratis going through the you know, the educational and internship programs um, is is quite unique, and you don't see it uh, when you travel country to country and do these types of large scale projects. Um, and uh, Tawazan has a program called the Seeds Program um, that takes the best of their best and then makes them available and puts them up for uh, key internships um, in the defense space. Um, and all you have is a success story after success story. Um, uh, a, a group of professionals who take their future seriously. Um, and I think we in the defense sector are very fortunate that um, we tend to work with some pretty exciting technologies and product lines. Um, and um, what ends up happening is those exciting technologies and product lines ends up, end up serving as an inspiration for these generations of Emiratis who are looking um, for something to focus on um, from a career standpoint. Um, there's a, a related point is not every participant on this, on this uh, panel or not the panel, but on this call is a large scale defense contractor that can set up a very large pipeline of education, internship and professionalism. So um, it's worth reminding the smaller defense contractors who are participating today that um, what is created by uh, the, the larger defense contractors is an ecosystem um, that these Emirati professionals go on to work. Um, and yes, they may start in a Boeing program or a general atomics program, um, but after so many years, um, they may be enticed to move on to a startup uh, or to a smaller defense contractor who's got an exciting piece of technology. So um, as these programs develop, um, quite a, a, a strong uh, defense and technology ecosystem um, has been created here in the UAE. Thank you very much. We're running a little bit low on time, so I'm gonna start sort of a three round. Uh, and we may not have time for everyone to come on on, on each question, but certainly feel free to. Uh, Bernie, I'm gonna direct this one to you to start. And this is about, you know, we're going to the headlines here. We're talking about the Abraham Accords. So 
your companies and Bernie, you specifically with Boeing have major business ties in both the UAE and Israel. How do you see normalization of ties between the UAE and Israel fostering bilateral defense cooperation and impacting the business base? Are these accords an opportunity for you as a US company to support Israel UAE cooperation in the future? And if so, how do you stand to benefit? Alternatively, um, are you concerned that the Abraham Accords will lead to U.S. businesses being cut out of deals in favor of Israeli companies now? What is your, your take on the Accords? Yeah, uh, Kirsten, thank you for that question. Uh, let me try to approach this more from the commercial standpoint than the defense standpoint uh, or the political standpoint. Um, there is no doubt that uh, the commercial aspects of the Abraham Accords are going to be uh, enormous and you can see it already on the ground. Um, you know, within uh, within days of the announcement, things were already happening. And um, if you've been following the news uh, yesterday, uh, a, a a Boeing 787 belonging to Itihad, which they called their uh, their green liner, we call it the dream liner, but they they emphasize the uh, the the economy of that aircraft. Um, flew up to Tel Aviv, uh, picked up a delegation of tourism and travel uh, uh, experts and flew them down here. Purpose being to put the final touches on a, uh, on a commercial accord uh, to open established flight routes between Tel Aviv and both Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And the plan is eventually to get to about 28 weekly flights between, uh, between the two countries. Uh, this is going to be enormous and um, you know just from the standpoint of trade which between the two countries will be primarily high tech uh, and uh, trade tourism commercial aviation you're looking at a real boom uh, to to the economies of both countries and uh, you know following on what i mentioned earlier about oil and the need to diversify the economy i think uh, this couldn't have come at a better time um, you know, this is really going to lead to uh, support for Abu Dhabi's, Abu Dhabi's Vision 2030 and the diversification of the economy and moving it toward a knowledge economy, uh, which is, of course, what they want and, uh, and what, they, what I believe they will get from this accord. And, you know, uh, the trade is, we've already seen a ship from Abu Dhabi uh, dock in Haifa port in Israel and offload uh, electronic equipment, iron, uh, other products from the UAE. And uh, it will then come back down here with, with, with Israeli produced stuff. And you're gonna see that ship basically making that trip every week. And so um, just a lot of stuff going on. It's moved very fast. It's going to support uh, Vision 2030 and the knowledge economy effort. And uh, I think that it's gonna float everybody's boats higher. Great outlook. Any comments, Mayor Paul Allen, uh, on your view, view of the Abraham Accords? Yeah, I, I would echo what Bernie said. It's clearly going to be a, an accelerant to to both economies on a variety of sectors, far beyond the reaches of the defense industry that we all participate in. But you know, more importantly for us, you know, we have so many of our programs that are international consortium or collaborative programs. And now having a relationship here between the UAE and between Israel, that only opens that door to continue those collaborative programs, to be in a position where you can bring the best of the best systems. And so it's an exciting time for us. You know, we have strong partnerships both here in the UAE and strong partnerships and relationships in Israel. And having this accord now uh, in an agreement and the opportunities that presents is only going to be an accelerant for all of the industries and ecosystem here, not only in the UAE, but regionally and in Israel as well. Thank you so much. I'm going to do a lightning round. So I'm going to give each one of you a question. And if you could address it uh, in our final moments, we'll start with Paul. And my question for you is under the auspices of DITSA, the U.S. has been urging the UAE to take greater strides to protect sensitive defense technology, and they're moving toward that. But U.S. defense companies are really the best assessors of how this the slow alteration of requirements processes is going. How have things improved, and what are the most critical areas that may still need some work? Then, Tamar, a follow-up for you will be, what advice do you have for the U.S. side pushing for these requirements? Are there things they should push harder on or things they should back off on? 
Um, Bernie, my last question for you. The UAE defense establishment is undergoing reform and modernization, and you all interface with a revamped MOI and defense industry you know, on a daily basis. Do you have any tips for smaller companies wading in on how to navigate this new landscape? Uh, and Alan, if I could for you, last question. Raytheon Emirates, being the first landed company in the UAE that we've talked about that is 100% owned for two years now, uh, how's that going? Do you feel like the structure has improved access to new contracts for Raytheon Emirates? Any advice on whether or not you would recommend to other companies that they pursue something similar? So Paul, if we can circle back, if you can talk to us for, uh, for, a, for a minute or two about um, the, the DITSA process and the strides toward protecting defense technology. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, in the years I've been here, certainly Norfolk Grumman has seen a tremendous improvement in the United Arab Emirates in their understanding of the needs of the US government uh, and so specifically the Defence Technology uh, Security Administration uh, and their necessary management of risk. You know, DITSA are, are looking at policies for defence transfer goods and services. Uh, quite rightly, they want to be assured to be able to assure Congress uh, and the US uh, taxpayer that those technologies developed primarily with US tax dollars aren't going to be leak into, uh, into the wrong hands. Uh, I think the UAE has made tremendous strides. I think the level of confidence is greater now than it was a few years ago, uh, thanks to the efforts of both the US government and the UAE government. And I think this strategic dialogue that we're having at government to government level will just help deepen that understanding uh, and broaden the, the areas of technology transfer that will become a permissible in, in the next five to 10 years. Wonderful. Tamar, the follow-up, are there things, do you have advice for the U.S. on things to push harder or things to back off on? Far be it for a defense contractor to uh, advise the U.S. government. However, um, I would um, stress uh, when it comes to this particular area of interest, um, the UAE has been a, a very willing participant. Um, and it, it really, the best way to, to describe um, their level of sincerity and participation in establishing those organizations to protect those technologies is go back to the UAE 20, 25 years ago. And the way that it found foreign investment was to protect investor rights um, and ownership. And the same really is happening now when it comes to um, technology and securing that technology. So the UAE has a long track record of um, doing what's right um, by those who invest in this country. And the same is true when it comes to investing in these technologies. Um, one point is they're very aware here in the UAE that um, in order to, to, to operate at that level and have access to um, the world's greatest technologies, that these measures need to be put in place. And um, like I said, I, I, I wouldn't advise the uh, US government to do anything that it has been doing, which is um, providing great guidance and working uh, strongly with its, its key ally. Okay, Tamar, you're safe. The US government frequently relies on the people on the ground doing the real work to- Perfect. <laughs> um, and, and Bernie, can you now give us a few tips for smaller companies in dealing with the new defense sector landscape in the UAE? Sure. If I were uh, if I were advising small companies, and I know there may be some on this phone call right now, whether it's here in the UAE or whether it's anywhere in the Middle East, uh, step one is you've got to implement the three P's. That's presence, persistence, and patience. You got to be there. You got to be patient, and you got to be persistent. Uh, number two, you've got to understand the customer's needs and priorities and make them yours. Uh, I see companies all the time deciding what they think the customer needs. And typically the customer and the more sophisticated customers such as the Emiratis already know what they need. You gotta figure that out and make that your priority. Number three, you gotta develop relationships. Uh, that's the key to business anywhere in the world and certainly here in this region and this country. And number four, uh, get ready for a long ride because this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, I've seen companies that don't have the wherewithal to come in here and have that presence and, 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 and persistence and patience that I talked about. They wanna come in here and three months later sign a contract and, uh, and you know, do the happy dance. It doesn't work that way. It's gonna take time, but in the end, you can't succeed. 
Thank you so much, Bernie. So you're recommending a half a century of, uh, of time on the ground and investment to really reap the rewards that companies like you four have, have seen. It's, it's it wild. might not take that long, but um, it, it, you're not gonna get it done. But be ready for it. Sure. <laughs> and, then, and then Alan, our last question, any lessons learned you can share about, about the benefits or, or, or um, drawbacks of being a landed company for, for other corporations out there? Yeah, well, well, certainly we feel very privileged to be one of the first landed companies here in the UAE. And I'll tell you, we've got the first P covered is the presence here. And so, you know, we're, we're pleased with our progress. We have over 100 employees here in country supporting various systems and solutions that we have in the region. We've hired a number of Emiratis, and we're starting to work with the industry here to develop those new technologies, those new capabilities. And more importantly, we really want to be seen as an Emirati company because we want to support the made in the UAE brand and be a part of that industry, a part of the igniter to launch those new capabilities, those new technologies, whether it's in or outside the defense industry, we wanna be a part of that. You know, We have four fundamental businesses that we're focused on here. You know, Our traditional effector, air missile defense, and then our cyber business. You know, We protect the .gov in the US as Raytheon information and in, in space. And so as we start to look at these netted systems and solutions, those have to be protected from a cyber attack because the cyber attack here is as persistent as a counter UAS or a UAS attack. And so we're pleased, you know, as Bernie said, this is not a transaction, this is a long-term play. It is the next legacy for Raytheon Technologies here is to have that local company presence, but more importantly, have it be an Emirati presence where they feel the sense of pride of made in the UAE. Thank you all so much. This has been incredibly informative, really helpful. Um, I'm taking away from this that, you know, part of the success of the US UAE cooperation and the success of the UAE's growing defense industry has been both UAE vision and talent and the UAE's smart decision in making the US its strategic partner in this endeavor, plus just the, the, the US private sector's willingness to to have that patience and presence and persistence. Uh, thank you again. I'm turning it back over to Danny Seabright to take us home. Kristen, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. You just did an amazing job of uh, leading us through this roadmap, if you will. And uh, I could not be more pleased to connect again with all of my friends there and on the ground in Abu Dhabi and Dubai in the defense vertical and sector. We're so proud of what you and your companies are doing. Uh, for America and for our relationship uh, uh, relationships in the UAE. I want to offer a word of congratulations to the U.S. government and the UAE government for uh, the strategic dialogue, uh, which will, is actually going to happen, I think, in the next minute or two. We'll be kicking off this morning between um, uh, Secretary Pompeo and Sheikh Abdullah, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah, the Foreign Minister. And this, as many on the, of the panelists have said, is an amazing new opportunity uh, to move the relationship forward. And we could not be more pleased and more proud uh, that this is happening. So with that, if I could say thank you to all of our attendees from around the world for joining us this morning. Thank you again to Kirsten and to our panelists. Please have a wonderful day, a safe day, and all best wishes. Take care and goodbye.